Okay, so thanks for coming to this. Um, I appreciate it. Now, I'm glad to see that uh, we there's enough chairs. I was worried about that. Now, this is a, a free course, um, and everybody's seen the email, so I don't have to explain what that what that is, uh, what the reason why we're doing it. But I just want to say that here are the readers, and I didn't couldn't afford a binder, so I went to Chinatown and got a, a thing that you you know, a, a twist tie, but it, it basically, if you, if you get this, it's $20, and it's worthwhile to you if you, to cover the cost of the copy, and there'll be more copies in subsequent weeks, so it's worth it if you plan to stick with the course, and you plan to uh, do the readings, and uh, there, and there are also online readings through the email, um, if I'm, if you, give us your email, but a lot of them, not these ones, these are not online, these are from different books that are from the library, uh, So, and, or in some cases, um, David's uh, uh, lectures, so they're not, uh, they're not available online. So, uh, good evening everybody. Uh, I'm looking forward to the course, and I hope that uh, that you'll be very interested and that uh, you'll find it interesting enough to stay on. Uh, I am an academic and some of the ideas that we are going to be discussing are academic, but each of these ideas is fired up with passion for animal rights and for veganism. I see them as connected. Paul was talking about um, how activism and academics are complementary, and I think that's very much the case. I think that uh, with animal rights, that it's really a thinking person's kind of activism. People who unthinkingly go along with the status quo do so readily, but it takes something of an extra leap for some people to go beyond that and to see a non-human point of view, a point of view that's very often silent, uh, in conventional terms at least. So um, without further ado, uh, why don't we start a little bit of a guided tour of the animal ethics world. Now, the animal ethics world is something that's very similar in some ways to the human ethics world. Many of the ethical theories that are meant to guide our conduct towards human beings are theories that can be deployed on behalf of non-human animals as well. Here we have a picture of the old master, Immanuel Kant. Seventeen nineties is when he did most of his work as an old man. He was an old man and uh, philosopher David Hume woke him up from his dogmatic slumbers, as he puts it, and he flashed to life with perhaps the most influential rights theory of all time. Now, uh, let's go through some basic terminology for ethics before we get started to give you a bit of a, a sense of the uh, landscape. Ethics is a study of moral good and bad, right and wrong, virtue and vice, and justice and injustice. Um, central to thinking about ethics is thinking about what's good as one component of it. So uh, there are two kinds of good that were basically either invented or let's say acknowledged and identified by the ancient philosopher Aristotle. He distinguished between instrumental goods, which are tools, and intrinsic goods. Now, tools are used to obtain intrinsic goods, and an intrinsic good is a good that's good in itself. In itself is the kind of thing we want. For example, uh, Buddy and Baby, the doggies here, like us, tend to value friendship, and many people consider friendship to be good in itself. Uh, the friendship in itself is something we find good or rewarding. It doesn't have to lead to anything else, uh, whatever, careerist goals or anything else. So instrumental good and intrinsic good. Now, in the case for animal rights, Tom Regan uses an additional term called inherent value. And he applies it to animals. 
And inherent value is different. It's neither a, a tool like instrumental good, nor something that's good in itself for, let's say, sentient beings. Inherent value is, means something like dignity. And we're going to discuss more about dignity as we explore the rights theories. Uh, Joel Feinberg defines rights in the following manner. To have a right is to have a claim to something and against someone, the recognition of which is called for by legal rules in the case of moral rights, uh, or in the case of moral rights, the principles of an enlightened conscience. So you can have moral rights, which are claims that are meant to be a very rigorous entitlement. Uh, so you can have moral rights or legal rights, and legal rights are obviously or not obviously a reflection of moral rights. Speciesism. This was a term that was introduced in 1970 by Richard D. Ryder, R-Y-D-E-R, -E a British psychologist and philosopher. And speciesism means discrimination on the basis of species or species characteristics. Now, the main anti-animal rights or anti-animal liberation philosophers say that they're not speciesist on the basis of species. So, for example, R.G. Fry, Michael P.T. Leahy, Michael Allen Fox, when he was anti-animal rights, now he's pro, uh, and various others have disavowed that they discriminate merely on the basis of species, which is fortunate because that rather resembles discriminating just on the basis of biological sex or so-called race and so forth. Rather, uh, they make discriminations on the basis of spe uh, species characteristics. And some of the speciesists maintain, excuse me, some of the speciesists maintain that only humans have rationality. Others maintain that humans have rationality to a surpassing extent and animals are inferior. In fact, if you had the leisure or cause to survey the animal ethics literature, you would quickly find out that the number one reason uh, or reasons that are used to rationalize the subjugation of non-human animals is that they are real or supposed mental inferiors. Animals are said to not have lesser rationality, which is a keystone kind of thing. Self-awareness, autonomy, which means self-governance, self-determination, uh, political participation, economic participation, moral agency, linguistic ability, a whole host of higher cognitive functions. Animals are deemed to be mentally inferior, and this is the number one argument. But it shows how weak speciesism is uh, that anti-speciesists are easily able to come back and say, well, look it, if you're saying that uh, those with so-called inferior mental capacities don't deserve respect, basically, then there are plenty of humans who are equally lacking in autonomy, rationality, self-awareness, and so forth. And never, never in the entire history of discourse has any speciesist philosopher been able to come up with a better response than R.G. Fry, who says, well, yes, let's vivisect the mentally disabled humans too. That is the only and most decisive response, but it just reveals how violent Professor Fry actually is, and it reminds us of the sum Oh, 450,000 mentally disabled humans who were murdered by the Nazis during the Holocaust. Many of them vivisected, many of them in the starving pavilions and uh, otherwise degraded or tortured to death. So that's the best that the species can do. And believe me, that's not very good. Um, a moral agent is someone such as yourselves who acts with reference to moral categories, such as rights, uh, moral good and bad, and so forth. A moral patient, which is spelled the same way as a medical patient, is someone who is, oh, sorry, I was starting to wander there. <laughs> a moral patient is someone who is either uh, a beneficiary of moral action or someone who's harmed by moral action. They're benefited or harmed by moral actions. Uh, moral standing 
means that you count in ethics. Moral status you could use. It means that you have some kind of basic practical respect, whether in the form of having rights or utilitarian consideration, or you will be regarded with empathy or sympathy, or someone will behave virtuously towards you. These are all different theories, but moral patients are the beneficiaries according to the theoretical type. So moral agents, moral patients. All moral agents are moral patients, but the range of moral patients is much larger than that of moral agents. And many people such as Steve Saponsis and Mark Beckhoff, the cognitive ethologist, Saponsis is a philosopher, have argued that in fact um, many non-human animals are moral agents as well. Very interesting. An intuition is a fundamental belief in an ethical view so fundamental that no other belief justifies it. An intuition is a rock-bottom ethical belief. Some philosophers who defend intuition say that they're self-evidently true, but in any case, they're not justified by anything else. And a lot of skeptics attack intuitions as mere prejudice, but um, it, nevertheless, uh, it's probably the most pervasive method in ethical theory and all of the ethical theories that I'm going to outline tonight can be boiled down to intuitions. Um, consequentialism. Consequentialism refers to a family of moral theories where moral right and wrong is judged solely with reference to consequences. Consequences are the outcomes of actions, right? So uh, prominent examples of consequentialist theories are ethical egoism. A common form of that is that every moral agent should maximize his or her self-interest. And uh, some say the genius of ethical egoism is that you can get principles encouraging people to respect each other based solely on self-interest. That is to say... It's in everybody's interest to agree, for example, to uh, rules of nonviolence. Uh, University of Waterloo professor Jan Narvison, or is it Jan Narvison, he says that uh, nonviolence is the primary thing that ethical egoists should agree to because it's in everybody's interest to agree to that and to reciprocate. If everyone reciprocate, then the system works. Uh, to some extent, but of course, animals are traditionally excluded from this social contract of egoists. A second consequentialist view looks at consequences for a particular group, and that's why it's called ethical particularism. And that means that you put a particular group, such as a religious group, or a, politi a political group, um, or a species, or some group, ahead of all others, and you act to benefit the group, aristocracy and so forth. But the most famous, uh, the most disputed moral theory of all time, according to ethicist Antony Flew, is utilitarianism. And it's the most complicated ethical theory that I'm going to be explaining to you tonight. And I'm going to save my spiel on utilitarianism until a bit later. Non-consequentialism. The other huge family of moral theories that does not judge moral right and wrong solely with reference to consequences. And a primary example of that is deontology, D-E-O-N-tology. And here's the man who originated that in the course of human history, Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher. Deontology means the study of duty. And Kant believed that we have perfect duties, that we must never murder, we must never lie. Even if the Nazi comes knocking at your door about the Jew in your attic, you must never lie. Of course, subsequent theorists have taken issue with that. But this shows that Kant models duty. The ancient Stoics used to say, though, though the heavens may fall, in other words, no matter what the consequences. So he's a primary example of not only the birth of rights theory, well, if you go back, there's Locke, but he's really the most impressive progenitor of rights theory in the history of ethics.
Okay, ethical nihilism, uh, N-I-H-I-L-ism, nihilism, it comes from the Latin uh, term nihilo, which means nothing. Ethical nihilists believe that basically there's nothing in the way of absolutes, moral absolutes, to guide us. And nihilists may feel emboldened to do anything. Anything goes is a kind of slogan for ethical nihilism. Ethical relativism is a term that refers to views that deny moral absolutes, like the nihilists, but ethical relativists tend to say that we can nevertheless think of ethics uh, relative to a given cultural context. So we could talk about nor North American ethics, and of course we can talk about subsets of different kinds of uh, North American ethics, subcultures, if you will. So ethical relativists also deny absolutes, but ethics is still real relative to certain groups. So there's group ethical relativism, and not as well known, technically, there's individual ethical relativism. Uh, that's where, again, there are no more absolutes in the conception, and it's all relative to the individual. But the more common term for that individual ethical relativism is ethical subjective. but ethics is intelligible relative to the opinions of the individual. Now let's start with our ethical theories, now that we have a, something of a grasp of some of the terminology. And we have a blog for the course, which is easily accessible. We're going to post this glossary of terms and a few other goodies on the blog for your convenience and learning. So we're going to start uh, our survey of rights theories with Kant. Now, Kant's test of moral principles is, and Paul York here is a scholar who's looking at religious studies with respect to Kantian theory and uh, ethics pertaining to animals and the environment. So, Ken would test a moral principle in the following way. He would apply what's called the universalizability test. Uh, Universalizability I should note that we'll, we'll cover this again in, in the third lecture, uh, third plot. Yes, if you'll bear with us, there's going to be some repetition in the course, but the purpose is here to give an overview, and then later we'll have an opportunity to zero in and get a much richer sense of detail. So we don't mean to be repetitive, we just mean to be, uh, to give you a thorough presentation uh, within constraints, of course. So what does universalizability mean? Well, Kent gives the example of a shopkeeper. Kent would say, take the maxim of your action. Maxim, M-A-X-I-M. What that means is, take a principle that will encapsulate the kind of thing you intend to do. So the shopkeeper is uh, dishonestly contemplating shortchanging a customer. So we, that's the maximum of his action, uh, shortchanging people. Now, Kant says, does it pass the universalizability test? To see, let's try universalizing our maximum of action. If we do that, then we envision all moral agents uh, going by the principle of shortchanging customers or people, depending how general you want to get. And Kent says, well, that's not going to work at all. That's going to contradict the will of the moral agent in question. Uh, the moral agent who's universalizing doesn't want to be shortchanged. Thank you very much. So it doesn't pass the universalizability test. Now. Kant was very interesting, and he called uh, act according to those maxims which you can at the same time will as universal law. That's basically what I was describing to you. And he calls that the categorical imperative. Now, categorical means absolute, no exceptions, 
The logical contrary is hypothetical, and he says, this is absolute universalizability. There are no exceptions for ethics of this kind. And interestingly, Kant thought that an equivalent to universalizability was the following maxim. Act so that you treat persons uh, never as a means only, but always at the same time as an end in himself or herself. What does it mean not use as a mere means? Well, if someone's running a sweatshop, they're really using the slave laborers, in effect, as mere means, just tools or instruments. That's why I use the term slave, although it may not be a perfect uh, term, but the color of it is pretty evident in the term. And uh, treating someone as an end in himself, well, what does that mean? Well, you have means and you have ends. Uh, my speaking is a means of conveying information. I have an end of conveying information here tonight. And so Kant is loosely using the term end to mean more than a means. Uh, if you're an end in yourself, then you have a dignity. Then you are to be respected. You're not merely to be exploited. And basically, exploitation means some kind of harmful usage, really, regarding someone as a mere tool. And um, so, interestingly, Kant had a third formulation of the categorical imperative. People, we're not doing criticism this time, we're, we're just doing analysis. So we're just introducing some of the views. Next time, in our guided tour, we're going to point to some criticisms that could be directed at the different views, positive or negative. Criticism isn't just griping at people. It's often evaluating favorably as well. Uh, so the third formulation of the categorical imperative is to act always according to a kingdom of ends. And what that means is a kind of community where persons are treated as ends in themselves. Translation, with dignity, with respect, with rights uh, as well. So, uh, scholars have debated whether these three versions are actually the same, and you can just envision that that would go on just about forever, but we are not entitled to go on forever tonight. Kant's theory of uh, rights for rational beings, uh, in his groundwork of the metaphysic of morals, Kant said, rational existence exists as an end in itself. Rational existence exists as an end in itself. So he only counts rational beings. If you're non-rational, you're out of luck. Although he did give a lecture on ethics where he said that um, uh, killing a dog who's retired from service would be wrong because it would model bad behavior that might influence how we treat human beings. So there was some consideration given to the dog, but the dog was a practice dummy for virtue, to use the term of W. David Ross, the ethical theorist. Oh, by the way, Ross came back at Ken and said, we can't have these absolute rules. If the is knocking at your door, you lie. Instead, uh, Ross said, we have prima facie duties, not perfect duties that are unexceptionable. So prima facie means on the face of it, yeah. So at first glance, you have a duty to beneficence, benefiting others, non-maleficence, not doing bad to others, promise-keeping, and various other duties of gratitude, for example. Uh, I think there's about eight of them in total, but they're all prime, they're absolute duties if there's nothing to compete with them, but if there's a conflict of duties, if you're on your way to meet a friend and you rescue a child who's drowning, then clearly you've made a judgment call for one duty instead of the other. That's a real sophistication built on the old master. That guy in the top left corner pictured there, is, it's an image of John Rawls. And he caused a great deal of excitement when he published A Theory of Justice in 1970. A Harvard ethicist, and he's a neo-Kantian. Rawls maintained that to get an idea of justice, we should actually try to blind ourselves. Now, that science sounds kind of paradoxical because we think of theory as enlightening us. We gain awareness or knowledge or 
something like that. Uh, reasonable beliefs, call it what you will. That's why I have the image of justice, the lady with the uh, blindfold on, because it's really embodied in Rawls's theory more than any other theory that I know of. So Rawls says, to get a sense of justice, imagine that we're spirits who are not yet born. We're going to be incarnated, have a body, but we're not yet born. Now, Rawls is not asking you to believe in spirits or out of bodies or anything like that. What this is, is a, it's a thought experiment. A thought experiment is a scenario that philosophers use for learning purposes. And that's exactly what this is. So imagine that you're not yet born. How would we come up with rules of justice for when we are born? For when we're in the world, bopping around, doing stuff. And Rawls says that what we need is a veil of ignorance. And I smile as I say this because it sounds so paradoxical, a philosopher talking about ignorance, but it's for a purpose. The purpose is you don't know as the spirit whether you're going to be born with dark skin or lighter skin as a male or a female. You don't know if you're going to be uh, rich or poor, if you're going to be gifted with intelligence or let's say mentally disabled. Uh, you don't know any of that, and that's just for the purpose, because Rawls says it's just to formulate principles that we could formulate behind a veil of ignorance because it will be out of self-interest. Reminiscent of Kant, uh, Kant's agent not contradicting his own will by universalizing something, here we have a veil of ignorance, and someone's not going to universalize something because they could end up being poor when they're born. They could end up being less intelligent and so on, and the rules would apply to that. So again, it wouldn't be in your self-interest uh, to agree to it. Um, so uh, did I say that the theorist who applied Kant's theory to animal rights was Julian Franklin. Uh, he published a book, I think it was in 2005, uh, that did it. I couldn't find an image for Franklin, though. Uh, it's actually uh, the essay that, that, that uh, on that is in the reader of his book. Ah, splendid. Yeah. Splendid. Yes, and I think we're talking in week three more about him, am yeah. I right? Yeah. So yeah, um, Franklin extended that theory to animal rights, and these two marks here uh, extended Rawls' theory to animals. Rawls was a speciesist, and he said, well, there's duties of sympathy to animals, but it gets really vague after that. And he was just a speciesist. But uh, Rowlands, uh, especially, because he really, really, really unpacks it in two books. Um, and Bernstein Moore, in passing, in a book on moral considerability, uh, they say, well, you don't know if you're going to be human or not either. And for those speciesists who fixate on things like rationality, are you rational? Um, you don't know if you're going to be a rational being or not either. So uh, animal rights theorists have fruitfully extended Rawlsian ethics uh, to animal justice and, in fact, animal rights. Rawls was very particular to insist that his was only a theory of justice, not a theory of any other department of ethics, but it has been extended fruitfully to rights, excuse me, and other concerns of ethics. <coughs> excuse me. Our next set of theorists, uh, a third Neo-Kantian here, is Alan Gewirth, okay? And this lovely person, Evelyn Pluth, is an old buddy of mine. Haven't spoken to her for many years, but she's a wonderful, wonderful person. And uh, she extended Gewirth's uh, insights to animal rights again. Okay, what was Gewirth's deal here? Um, Coworth insisted, and this is again very clever, like the other rights constructions, Coworth said to do anything at all, to do anything, you need some degree of well-being, and you need some degree of freedom. And I include here images of someone uh, who's sick in hospital and probably can't, let's say, can't do much for the sake of our thought experiment, 
as <laughs> someone in a straitjacket to illustrate loss of freedom. So he's got a point. Um, assuming this guy's really incapacitated, or they're both incapacitated, they can't do very much. So Kaworth had the insight to say, everyone should declare that they need well-being and freedom. And everyone should declare that they have rights to well-being and freedom. And due to uh, what uh, Gaworth called the uh, principle of generic consistency, uh, due to the principle of generic consistency, we should extend that same consideration to animals. Evelyn pointed out that animals too have desires. Uh, Gaworth says, that um, basically you need freedom or well-being to implement any desires whatsoever. Uh, perhaps glibly, he says someone who's suicidal even needs well-being and freedom to kill themselves. And he says after that they're not a concern. Uh, anyway, um, the principle of generic consistency, uh, genera, I believe in Latin means kind. So generic consistency is just being consistent about kinds of things. So if you're going to say that an agent has rights because they need well-being and freedom, well, there's others that equally are of the kind uh, that they also need these things. So we should extend rights to all based on the principle of generic consistency, which can favorably be compared to the principle of universalizability in Kant. Um, uh, right. right. But there are others in ethics. Um, as I said, all ethical theories can be boiled down to intuitionism, fundamental bedrock beliefs. So to illustrate, uh, Gewirth has the intuition that, uh, well, he has the actual fact that everyone needs a certain amount of well-being and freedom to act, but then he introduces the intuition that individuals should claim rights to freedom and well-being. Uh, and then he intuits the principle of generic consistency to extend to all persons these rights. Um, Tom Regan, however, is an explicit intuitionist. He calls himself a reflective intuition, is which means that he has these fundamental beliefs, but they're not just gut responses, he says. They're not just opinions or prejudices. Uh, rather, they are considered beliefs that he's reflected on and he's thought about conceptual clarity, consistency, factual accuracy, and all this sort of thing. Um, a very formidable idea. And Tom Regan intuits that what he calls subjects of a life what is a subject of a life? A subject of a life is someone who has a life in the biographical sense as opposed to merely the biological sense. Someone with a biography has a life story. Things matter to the subject of a life. And in the case for animal rights, 1983, Regan identifies 10 characteristics of a subject of a life which include memory, goals for the future, self-awareness, and several other uh, characteristics. Um, and from the fact that uh, subjects of a life have equal inherent value, which is what he intuits, uh, from that you can derive what he calls the respect principle. And that again is intuited too, because it's all a little fuzzy, uh, but that's fine. And from the respect principle, uh, Dr. Regan intuits what he calls the harm principle, uh, which is actually more of a principle of avoiding harm. Um, I, I don't know why he doesn't use something like the principle of nonviolence. He was certainly marching with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the civil rights marches in the South, and he was also very influenced by Gandhi, who said that nonviolence is the greatest principle ever. But anyway, Gary Francione, though, is very explicit about nonviolence, more so recently than ever before. He never uttered the word nonviolence in any of his previous books, but uh, that's changed for some reason. 
And uh, he's not so much an explicit intuitionist. He doesn't kind of advertise that he's an intuitionist. But like the Worth and the others, it's quite plain that he is. Uh, Francione says in his introduction to animal rights, page 34, I argue that the basic right not to be treated as property, that's his own peculiar conception of rights, may be derived directly from the principle of equal consideration and does not require the complicated rights theory upon which Regan relies. So he's taking a pot shot at Regan. These two used to be best buddies, or at least great friends, and then Regan agreed to go to the March for Animals at Washington, D.C. in 1996, which had welfareist groups participating, and after that, Gary cut off Regan and uh, has nursed uh, uh, less than friendly feelings towards Regan ever since. So what is uh, Francione referring to there? Well, Dr. Francione has an intuition that humans have an interest not only in not suffering, which animal welfare is talk about reducing the suffering of animals or avoiding unnecessary suffering. He says humans also have an interest in not being considered property. So you don't want to be treated as a slave, as an object, as a mere resource, um, uh, as someone who's owned. So uh, basically, uh, Francione uh, borrows, but without much attribution to Peter Singer. Peter Singer talks about the principle of equal consideration uh, in animal liberation. Um, we'll get to his utilitarian view soon. Uh, and um, Francione says, well, due to the equal consideration of it, due to the equal consideration of interests, um, the interest in not being considered property applies to everyone too. Moving right along because I'm running out of time here. Com rights based on compassion. Gautama Buddha is pictured there, and also Joan Dunnier, a contemporary. Um, I'm not going to say much more about it. Um, Dunnier also bases rights not only in compassion, but also justice. And I don't mean to uh, oversimplify Buddhism right now either, but I am. Because he talks about <laughs> right conduct as well and so forth. Uh, some base animal rights and tradition. Uh, Bernard Rollin calls it common sense. Uh, I see that as an encapsulation of tradition. Call me wrong, I don't know. Steve Saponsis says it's based in everyday morality, which again seems to reflect uh, traditions. And Joseph Raz is an example of a human rights theorist who uses that sort of thing. Now, the utilitarians, this, again, it's the most difficult theory I can introduce, I think. A utilitarian doesn't dignify individuals the way I've described. On rights theory, each of you has a dignity, and none of you could be used for harmful medical research, even if theoretically great good could come from this research. Um, but utilitarianism is different. What utilitarians do is they say, we want to act for the most good overall. And um, so what we're going to do is we're going to say, consider the future, okay? This is the act utilitarian. There's two other kinds I'll get to. The act utilitarian says, here we are in time. You have one option and you have another option. Choose the option that has the most pleasure overall and the least pain overall, and don't choose the option that has lesser amount of pleasure or units of pain. But you see, all the units of pleasure and pain are glommed together in a huge aggregate. That's how you add up things, you see. Uh, so utilitarians are prepared to override the rights for individuals for the greater good. So that's act utilitarianism, actually trying to compute the greatest utility or pleasure units, less pain units in the situation. There's also rule utilitarianism. Rule utilitarians say that people are too tempted to be prejudicial and harmful and abusive or exploitive or neglectful. So instead, let's, use, let's choose that set of rules that will maximize the most pleasure and minimize the most pain. Another version of utilitarianism doesn't talk about pleasure and pain, but uh, preference satisfaction or avoiding preference frustration. 
So rule utilitarianism, right? Use it to justify rules like don't kill, don't steal. And there's indirect utilitarianism, which goes further and says, forget about being a utilitarian. Just be a person of good character who goes according to common sense morality. Uh, you will be faithful in your love. You will have a sturdy character. You will keep your commitments. You will be loyal according to common sense, whereas you're not going to be the calculating utilitarian. Hmm, maybe I'll betray this person if it, I think it's for the greater good and so on. Indirect utilitarians are very much like rights theorists in that sense. It gets a little confusing at that point, I suppose. That's the most complicated idea I have to explain, and I hope it was clear enough. Virtue ethics is something that started again with Aristotle. Aristotle believed that uh, we should all have virtues, personal characteristics, and not vices, which are bad personal characteristics. And he had a wonderful doctrine of the golden mean. The golden mean is neither too much, excess, nor too little, deficiency. Example, courage. That's a virtue. But if you take courage to excess, you get foolhardiness. If you take courage to deficiency, you get cowardice. The golden mean. Uh, Rosalind Hursthouse has vaguely extended it to animals and Zoe Weil has done the same. She's tried to name the best characteristics that a person could have. You know, kindness, honesty, uh, reliableness, and many things like that. And she says those kinds of people will really be good to animals. But she's not only a virtue ethicist, well, she's not really a moral philosopher, but I treat her with respect because she's a very enlightened thinker who, you know, has degrees from Harvard, and, but she also talks about the virtue of being kind. She wrote a book, of, Above All, Be Kind. That's a virtue, not cruelty. Uh, uh, cruelty is a vice. Ethical egoism we've talked about briefly. Pragmatism is the view that says that, okay, well, let's say that we're skeptical and we don't agree that there are any moral absolutes. There's such cultural variation in ethics and opinions are so various, maybe the sensible thing is to admit that there are no moral absolutes, but we still need laws, and to have laws, we still need ethics. In fact, we still need ethics to interact with each other socially, uh, more informally than legal relations. So these great pragmatists said, let's look at practice and see what kind of ethics we can get from there. Pragmatists go by slogans such as, let's go by whatever works. Let's go by what people are comfortable with. But most pragmatists are speciesists. But it's not inevitable, and pragmatism can be extended to animals. So this is ecoholism. And uh, ecoholism is the view that you shouldn't act just for individuals, but you should act for ecological or environmental wholes such as the earth, the biosphere, nature, species, or broader than that, the ecosystem, uh, biodiversity, bioregional narratives, the land. Aldo Leopold uh, used the example of the land, and J. Beard Collicott was an ecoholist after him. So um, that's a simple ecosystem modeled there just as a cutesy diagram, really. So that's ecoholism, and the Aldo Leopold had a famous say, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biological, or sorry, the biotic community. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. So Regan has objected that this is ecological fascism and that you can kill animals if they're threatening a, an endangered species of flower or something like that. Uh, the feminist ethic of care, and Sherpy tells me that I have one minute and 26 seconds, and this is my last theory, so whatever, that's good. Um, feminist ethic of care, that's Carol Gilligan. And I was just about to wander over again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, actually, he's Mr. Chair. I'm getting confused, but I've been talking a while, so no wonder. So Carol Gilligan is a very important feminist theorist. 
she was studying in the same laboratory as uh, Lawrence Kohlberg, the moral psychologist. He was studying uh, stages of moral development in humans. He observed how kids go from being largely self-centered and people go from following conventional morality through to broader kinds of recognition and to what he calls post-conventional morality, where you go beyond what society has taught you and you think for yourself. Many of you, or I don't know, perhaps all of you, are post-conventional uh, uh, people because you've gone beyond conventions and uh, thought for yourselves about some of these issues. So, Kohlberg was saying that Kantian type theory is basically the ultimate, that those who are mature will ascend to this. So she was a lab assistant to Kohlberg, and she said, well look, that doesn't seem right to me. There's a masculine voice in ethics, and the masculine voice in ethics says that we should go by abstract principles, such as rights and duties, or utilitarian calculation. But she said there's also a feminine voice in ethics, which is different. Instead of abstract, it's more concrete or down to earth. Instead of abstract principles um, and such, instead of rationality, it's more feelings. Instead of individuals having rights, it's relationships between individuals as well. And she stressed the value of caring. And so she innovated the ethic of care which is very similar to numerous views that have gone before that base ethics on compassion and so on. And uh, Carol J. Adams is a modern ethic of care uh, theorist. Um, she's done a lot of great work in there. If I could have found a picture of Josephine Donovan, I would have put her up too. Uh, brilliant ethic of care theorist. Adams and Donovan uh, authored a uh, book on ethic of care and animal rights. And, of course, there's spiritual ethics, too, but I'm not going to cover that tonight. So that concludes uh, the first lecture.